Nabisco. It's short for the National Biscuit Company. Just kind of taking the first few letters of each of those words. Am I right in saying that most of us think of them as the company behind the Oreo? They were the originators of the brand way back in 1912 and have been continuously producing that cookie for well over a century now. Introducing popular variations over that time, like the Double Stuff Oreo in the 1970s and Oreo O cereal in the 1990s. Year after year, it is ranked as the best-selling cookie in the country, and that's impressive. I know I'm thankful for it. I couldn't tell you how many Oreos I've had over the years. But the thing about Nabisco is that it's not just Oreos. I would consider them the all-time biggest, most important company when it comes to both cookies and crackers, and I would even rank them highly when it comes to consumer foods in general. Maybe you'd be surprised to hear that in the early 1900s, Nabisco was the biggest brand in food. In addition to being responsible for numerous iconic brands, they went on to be a major part of some of the biggest mergers and buyouts and spin-offs of all time. It is an incredible story, so for today, I want to talk about how they've been successful and what makes them so significant while highlighting some of the more notable brands, many of which you may not associate with Nabisco. This company goes back to the 19th century. I like saying it like that. It was in 1898 and right from the beginning, from the very first moment, they were already controlling their industry. See, right about that time in American history, a popular trend in business was to combine smaller companies into a bigger trust. It leads to economies of scale and helps eliminate the competition. I'm sure you all know about monopolies, but in the 1890s is when they were really becoming a concern. One of the most famous examples would be Standard Oil, who was still operating very strong at the time. Meanwhile, the Sherman Antitrust Act was being established earlier in that decade to try to contain them. Well, it turns out that the bakers of the country were doing something very similar. Basically, on one end, there was a lawyer named William Moore that helped combine eight large companies across ten states in the east to form the New York Biscuit Company. By the way, one of those companies was formed by John Pearson in the 1700s, who was credited with being the inventor of the cracker, so you can't be much more deeply rooted in the industry than that. And then on the other end, there was another lawyer named Adolphus Green that had combined 40 companies across 13 states and called that one the American Biscuit and Manufacturing Company. The big moment happened when those two ends combined to form the National Biscuit Company, later known as Nabisco, with well over 100 bakeries that were by far the largest in their industry. Starting off my list of Nabisco products, I believe that the only one that we would still recognize today that existed before the merger would be Fig Newtons. They were created by a company from Boston that merged into the New York Biscuit Company that decided to name them Newton after a nearby town. They would name all their products after nearby towns and that was the one that stuck. In fact, as of 2012, they are only called Newtons. They dropped the fig part from their name to better reflect their variety of flavors. Following that merger, Adolphus Green took control of managing the combined company and actually had a really effective approach. He would emphasize the importance of branding, marketing, and standardizing their products, all things that sound obvious today, but were much less common at the turn of the century and almost unheard of when it came to crackers. See, at that time, almost without exception, crackers were sold in a barrel. You know, that's where you get the name of the chain of restaurants. The local general store would put out a barrel of crackers and you would buy them that way, which wasn't the best way. Especially when you got to the bottom of the barrel, as people say, you'd commonly find them all broken up and wet and moldy. If there happened to be a rat or insect problem, that would be where you would find them. So to address all of those issues, Green introduced the cleverly named soda cracker, You Need a Biscuit. It's a shame this might be the first time you're hearing that name because this was a big deal. Here is a typical ad for You Need a Biscuit, and I want to point out a few things here. First off, it uses a version of that logo that would eventually become the Nabisco logo, giving the product a recognizable brand that would promote uniformity and familiarity, unlike those cracker barrels. But maybe more importantly is that it didn't say Nabisco in it, that wasn't even the name of the company yet, it said in or seal, which was their patented way of packaging them with a wax lining that was promoted to help keep the crackers dry, a concept that was further enforced by the raincoat worn by the boy holding the crackers. That is some effective marketing. He spent more money on advertising than anyone would have expected from a cracker company and was also sure to keep the prices low, five cents a box in the beginning. Overall, you have to admit that he provided a pretty attractive alternative to that barrel and the sales reflected that. They sold hundreds of millions of packages, so many that Green 
even remarked that Unita was the most valuable word in the English language. Obviously, over the years, the competition has become much tougher than that barrel of crackers, and the Unita brand hasn't maintained the same level of success. In fact, it appears that it has been discontinued in 2009, after 111 years. Personally, I have never had this cracker, and given how important it's been to the Nabisco company and food branding in general, I'd like to see it brought back so I can try it. Alright, I need to start going faster here, because there are a lot of iconic brands, and I am still in the 1800s. In 1902, they introduced Barnum's Animals Crackers, all ending with an S. Again, very much relying on the marketing by tying them into P.T. Barnum and the animals that he would use in his circus. Though it is interesting to note that the circus shut down in 2017, and the crackers have officially outlasted it. However, the following year, after complaints from PETA, the animals on the box were let out of their cage, which I think is good for them. They look kind of happier now, don't they? The boxes are also known for having that little strap on the top that was originally intended to be used to hang the box from your Christmas tree after you finished eating the crackers, but has since been used as a fun handle for kids to hold it and again just adds to the branding. Next up, in 2012, as I said, Nabisco introduced the Oreo. There is some controversy there though, in that their main competitor introduced a suspiciously similar looking cookie just four years earlier that they called the Hydrox. But again, I think that just shows the power of Nabisco. Despite starting four years behind with a very similar product, Nabisco had the size and the branding ability to make the Oreo America's best selling cookie. By 1917, when Adolphus Green died, the company was thought to be the largest in the world that sold branded food products. In 1928, not an original creation, but they acquired the Shredded Wheat Company for $35 million. Obviously, the maker of the popular cereal, in addition to the brand Triscuit, who in the early 1900s claimed to be the only food on the market made using equipment that was powered by electricity. They were located near Niagara Falls, so that was their big advertising angle, and the name Triscuit itself is confirmed to be a combination of the words biscuit and electricity. The cereal brand has since been sold, but they still make those electric biscuits. Electric biscuits? Can you believe that's what Triscuit stands for? On a side note, in that same year, they bought a Canadian company called Christie Brown & Company, named after their founder, William Christie. I only mention that one because to this day, Nabisco products are commonly branded under the name Christie in Canada, and that's where it comes from. Back to the list, the first one that you might not expect whatsoever is that they acquired the brand Milk Bone in 1931. They make those dog treats shaped like a bone that actually contain milk. Nabisco was the maker of them for 75 years before selling the brand in 2006. Then, in 1934, another big one, they introduced Ritz Crackers and yet another genius marketing move. The word Ritz is associated with high class, luxury type things. Well, 1934 was during the Great Depression when most people can only dream of luxury items and this simple cracker was their way to provide a small yet still affordable, I guess, taste of luxury. And the idea worked. It took three years for them to become the best selling cracker in the world and they have remained popular ever since. A couple more of them really quick. In 1947, they introduced Wheat Thins. They still make them today. And in 1961, they acquired Cream of Wheat but sold them in 2007. Then in the 1960s, they started their involvement with candies when they bought the company that made Junior Mints. Then three years later, back to cookies, they introduced Chips Ahoy. Kind of like a play on words from Ships Ahoy, like a sailor might say. I don't really understand the nautical theme beyond that, but it quickly became the country's best selling chocolate chip cookie. They even had these cheesy looking commercials early on with this guy named Mort Meek would transform into Cookie Man. I don't know, I can't watch them without laughing. Now, to this point, I think you'll agree that Nabisco has mostly been using their originality to grow into one of the main food brands. Of course, I've outlined a few acquisitions, but they've always been comparatively small and for outside brands that fit in very logically with their existing ones. But the 1980s was a completely different story. I can't even express how much this company changed over the course of that one decade because things are about to get crazy. For various reasons, the costs for Nabisco were rising and their strategy to counteract that was to scale their business. Early on in the decade, in 1981, they were part of a $1.9 billion merger where they came together with a company called Standard Brands. Most notably, they were the owners of Planters, Baby Ruth, and Butterfinger. So I'll go ahead and add those three to the list. Then in that same year, they added yet another candy brand when they bought Lifesavers for $250 million. That right there is going to be the end of my list because it becomes so insane at this point that I don't even think it makes sense to try and isolate these brands because you'll see what I mean. In 1985, Nabisco itself was bought by the tobacco company R.J. Reynolds for $4.9 billion, which at the time was the largest merger ever in the United States that did not involve an oil company. I know, that's confusing. Well, believe it or not, tobacco companies acquiring large consumer food companies was actually a 
very big trend in the 1980s. These tobacco companies were dealing with a lot of lawsuits, making cigarettes an increasingly risky business, and they wanted to diversify into other things. I do have a video about Kraft that talks more about it. They were bought by Philip Morris, another tobacco company, basically as a response to this. So again, this time with more context, in 1985, Nabisco was bought by R.J. Reynolds and added to all of these other consumer brands that they already owned, like Hawaiian Punch and Grey Poupon Mustard, to create the largest consumer products company in the country. They renamed it RJR Nabisco, and it just keeps getting crazier. Three years later, that company was bought by a private equity firm in a $25 billion leveraged buyout. That was the largest ever leveraged buyout at the time, and I'm sure that my regular viewers are getting very nervous when I say that. Maybe rightfully so, because by the end of the 1990s, the debt and the tobacco lawsuits and some other factors were making it very difficult for them to continue operating. Around that time, they ended up spinning off their U.S. tobacco business, selling their international tobacco business for $7.8 billion, and selling Nabisco to Philip Morris for $14.9 billion, not to mention the additional $4 billion in debt that they assumed. If you remember, Philip Morris was the other tobacco company that had bought Kraft, so the effect of this deal was essentially combining Nabisco and Kraft together. Are you seeing why it didn't make sense to continue that list? And there's still more to it. Seven years later, all of these food brands were spun off into their own company that was called Kraft. And five years after that, Nabisco, along with some other brands like Cadbury and Tang, were spun off from that company and named Mondelez International. Okay, I realize that. I really sped things up at the end there, but that's because I've already talked about most of that stuff in my video about Kraft. For the last few decades, their stories have interestingly been overlapping, so again, be sure to check out that video if you want to see more details from the other perspective. But first, let me know in the comments, did you know that Nabisco was so significant? Of course, we all know about the Oreo and the Ritz crackers, but they've been right at the center of so many different things. Trusts, branded products, mergers, a leveraged buyout, all in major ways, helping shape the world of business and the world of food. Two things that I love talking about on this channel, so any thoughts you have about Nabisco or anything else in this video, leave them in the comments. I'd like to hear what you have to say. Thank you for watching.